Hi, my name's Sean from EP Training Services. This is our, well this is the trilogy, this is our third video that covers the Driver CPC Module 4 uh, LGB Practical Demonstration Test. This is the practical test you're going to do after you passed your Module 2 case study. So the Module 2 case study, you do that at a local theory test centre, get at least 40 out of 50 right, quite straightforward. And then you'd come to somebody like us to do your module four practical demonstration test. So the way it works now is most training companies are what we call approved to do their own module four examinations. You might still do it down at the driving test center. More than likely, you're gonna be doing it with a local training company. So it's advisable to book in with a training company because they need to book your test. They need to supply your vehicle and obviously give you some some training as well so this video is going to go through all the questions and answers you're going to be given okay so it's a good idea still to have some practical tuition because the vehicles might be slightly different to what we're going to use so the dvsa say that as long as you have a good vehicle over three and a half tons that is classed as acceptable for the driver cpc module four this vehicle we're going to use for the video it is actually plated as a five tonner, so it's classed as a C1. And you should, or you're more than likely find that when you do your module four, it's more likely not gonna be on a rigid or an RT, but it's gonna be on a little seven and a half tonner. So this is what we're gonna use to demonstrate the answers. And we're gonna go through some of the questions, okay? Right, just to give you a heads up, there's five questions you're gonna get, five questions. To get a pass, you need to be getting at least 75 in each section, 75%, three out of four. The first four questions you're gonna get, whatever they may be, they require four answers. So to get a pass on that, you need to be getting three, at least three of those four correct. The fifth uh, section, which we're gonna look at a bit later, that's all to do with your walk round check and cockpit check. So there are numerous answers on that one. So we're looking for 75% in each section, but we also need to get 80% overall, which means in one of the questions, uh, we should be getting 100%. It's quite a straightforward examination. Memory is the key. Take your time with it as well. As far as the examination goes, you've got to have your driving license with you. No license, no test. You've got to have your module two theory test certificate with you as well. The test itself probably lasts about half an hour and you must use the vehicle to demonstrate your answers. This is a practical demonstration. So we're gonna go through the sections now. Section one kind of relates to ensuring the vehicle is not overloaded and using appropriate restraining devices to secure certain loads. We have done a video on load security and in it, it covers chains, ratchets, low tensioning bar and a dolly knot. You're not gonna be asked about a dolly knot and you're not gonna be asked about ratchets either. So the only thing you might be asked, sorry, you're gonna be asked about low tensioning bar and possibly chains. So the video that we've done about restraining devices, chains, low tensioning bar, don't bother with the other ones. The other questions you're gonna get that relate to section number one is ensuring the vehicle is not overloaded. There are actually three questions excluding the ones about using the appropriate restraining devices. There's one of three questions you get for section number one. Two of those questions relate to checking the vehicle's not overloaded. And it's the same questions with the same answers, just in a different order. So if we take that into account, you're gonna get one of two questions that's excluding the restraining devices. So we're gonna have a look at those questions. So the first one has nothing to do with making sure the vehicle's not overloaded. I just don't think it fits in any other category. This is all about making sure that you can complete your journey and you don't uh, run out of fuel. So the question you might be given, you're gonna go on a long journey beyond the range of this vehicle's fuel system. We wanna know what checks you're gonna carry out to make sure you don't run out of fuel, i.e. what you're gonna check on the fuel system. And what could you take with you to ensure you don't run out of fuel? So let's get rid of the bit where we can continue our journey because we're gonna run out of fuel. If we take a means of payment whether that be cash, credit card, fuel card, a means of payment might make sense. The other thing we're gonna do, just wanna come with me, as you would in a car, if you wanna make sure, or rather you need to make sure that you have enough fuel for your journey. So you get in a vehicle, 
turn the ignition on. I'm going to have a look at the fuel gauge. Just make sure you have enough fuel in there. Brilliant. So we're taking means of payment. We check the fuel gauges. The other requirement is that we go round to the fuel tank area. Now, normally lorries, you're going to find the fuel tank is exposed. You can get access to it. If you're going to do it on this, you can't get access to the fuel tank, but we still need to tell them what we'll be checking. So the first thing is fuel cap. Make sure that's secure. It's not leaking, fuel cap is secure. The other thing we want to do, if we could see the fuel tank, you'll find that they are secured by a couple of straps, which then in place have mountings which hold those straps in place. If those straps, straps uh, break or we have defects, you might lose your fuel tank. So I know it sounds a bit rudimentary, but fundamentally we want to make sure the fuel tank is secure to the vehicle. So you're going to go on a long journey. How can we complete our journey? What checks are we going to make to the fuel system? Take a means of payment, check your fuel gauges, make sure your fuel cap is secure, make sure the fuel tank is secure to the vehicle. You might get that one, it's not a very popular one, but what I think you're going to get the one of these two is, you're fully laden, you're ready to make a delivery, so you're in the yard, you're about to head out, start making deliveries, but you suspect you might be overloaded. I want to know what checks you're going to carry out before you leave the yard, and if you still didn't know if you're overloaded, where could you take that vehicle to? So, it says we're fully laden, so we have a load on the back of the vehicle. It's probably a good idea to work out what that load weighs, and we don't want to take it off the vehicle and weigh it. We want to try and work out what it weighs with the load sitting on the vehicle. So how could we do that? We could look at our manifest. We could look at our delivery sheet to see, to see if that would give us any information about the weight of the load. Failing that, we could look at the load itself, see if there's any stickers, labels, anything on there that could indicate what the weight of the load would be. So now we've looked at that information, we've worked out what that load weighs. We want to compare it against the limit, the constraints of the vehicle. So good vehicles over three and a half tons will have a thing called a ministry plate. And that will be kept in the, uh, in the vehicle, in the cab, should be easily accessible to the driver. It's going to provide certain information on that ministry plate, which we're going to have a look at at the moment, because you need to take your examiner to where it is. It's going to have information about tyres and so on and so forth. What we're interested in is the weight constraints, the weight limits. So on this particular vehicle, the ministry plate is just on the headboard here. And you will see, or you should see on here, you've got gross weight, gross train weight, uh, leading axle and the rear axle. You've got your limits on there. They're not always kept there, but they should be somewhere in the cab. So you take them to the ministry plate. He's not going to ask you for descriptions of <coughs> what gross weight, gross weight, vehicle weight means. However, please make a mental note. Gross weight is also known as maximum authorized mass, M-A-M. -M. It will not be displayed on there. What we will display is gross weight. But make a mental note, you're gonna to need to know this in a minute. Gross weight yeah, is also known as maximum authorized mass. So getting back to the question, fully laden, we're about to head out, start making deliveries. We suspect we're gonna be overloaded. What we're gonna do, we work out the weight of the load, delivery sheet, look at the load itself. We then take them to the ministry plate, identify the ministry plate on the vehicle. One more thing we're gonna have a look at on the vehicle. We're gonna to head towards the rear of the vehicle. And if we come around here, you'll see we've got twin tires at the back. If you've got too much weight bearing down on these two twin tires, they're gonna do one of two things. They're gonna to touch in the middle and you're gonna get bulges. So you go to the twin tires at the back, make sure they're not touching, check for bulges. Okay, you've done all that, you worked out the weight of the load, you've gone to the ministry plate, you've even done the tires. You still don't know if you're overloaded. You could then take it to a weighbridge and get it checked. I would advise that you book it in before you leave, therefore, should you get stopped by DVSA, you have a letter confirming you're going to check your, um, you're not overloaded. Okay. So that's one of the questions. The other question, exactly the same question, 
in a slightly different order. This is section one still. Where would you find the maximum authorised mass of this vehicle? And what other checks would you carry to make sure you're not overloaded? So this time, if you remember, gross weight, also known as maximum authorised mass. So we take them to the ministry plate this time in the cab. And we indicate the gross weight is the same as maximum authorised mass. Next thing we're going to do, if you remember, work out the weight of the load. How can we do that? Look at your delivery sheet. Have a look at the load itself. We're going to go back again. And this time I'm going to check the tyres again, if you remember. No touch in the middle. No bulges. You've done all that. You still don't know if you're overloaded. You take it to a weigh bridge. So section number one, restraining devices, making sure we don't run out of fuel. And those two questions that relate to making sure the vehicle is not overloaded. Same question, same answer, different order. Right, that's section one. We're gonna move on to section number two now. This is about the security of the vehicle and its contents. Got one of three questions here, okay? All right, let's have a look at this one. You need to leave your vehicle unattended. So the question is where and how might you consider parking it? So if we imagine we're carrying goods that are dangerous, high consequential, even high value, your governor probably doesn't want you parked under some dimly lit bridge in the middle of nowhere. They'd probably like you to park it in a lorry park, a well lit, secure lorry park. The vehicle you're driving for this test as well, it's got barn doors, okay? So in terms of where and how, well lit, secure lorry park, park the rear of the, the rear of the vehicle up against the wall or another vehicle. We would then lock it, keys. You can go round every door. I'm not going to show you how to do that. You've been opening and closing doors all your life. You go round, you make sure all the doors are locked. The other thing that you need to do is set an alarm. Now, I know that these days, alarms are pretty much set on one key fob. However, these questions were written 15 years ago. So back then, they probably had two systems. So one is for locking the doors. You go round, make sure they're locked. The other one is you set an alarm or a mobiliser. So, well lit secure lorry park, park the rear of the vehicle up against the wall of the vehicle, lock it, go round, make sure it's all locked, activate the alarm or the mobiliser. Now when you come back from your comfort break, I don't want you doing a walk round check and cockpit check. What we want to do is walk round and check for any interference or any tampering. That's one of the questions. Another one could be, you've been given a different vehicle, different vehicle to drive for the first time today. Show and tell me all the practical checks you carry out before driving this vehicle off. If you're given a new vehicle, a different vehicle for the first time, and you're gonna go on a public highway, you're gonna be liable for that. So it's probably a good idea that you make sure there are no defects on that vehicle. And we do that by doing a thing called a walk round check and a cockpit check. Uh, you would have to do that now for this question if you've been given a different vehicle to drive for the first time. I'm not going to do that bit right now because when we come to section number five, you're going to have to do the walk round check and cockpit check then. So rather than duplicating the whole thing, I'm going to do the walk round check and cockpit check at the end for question number five. However, if for section number two, You've, you've been told you're driving a different vehicle to drive for the first time, you will have to do a walk round check and a cockpit check. There's something else I want to know about this vehicle. This is not weight constraints now. This is all to do with um, other constraints. So we might take into account the length, the width, the height of the vehicle. If a vehicle is over three metres, legally that height must be displayed in the vehicle. Now for the purposes of the examination, should open it. If we just look above the dash here where the taco is, you'll see that we put the length, the width and the height, the dimensions there. Okay, so you've been given a different vehicle to drive for the first time today. Remember, you're gonna do a formal walk round check. You're gonna do a cockpit check. You're gonna tell them what the dimensions are. And the final thing you need is enough fuel for your journey. Okay, so section number two, uh, we cover two of the questions now, leaving your vehicle unattended, being given a different vehicle to drive today. The other one, 
is all about bridge strikes. So you've been given the keys to drive a high-sided vehicle on an unfamiliar route. I want to know what checks you're going to carry out before you leave the yard, how you can satisfy yourself that that height is correct, and what is the protocol, who do you contact, and what information should you hit a railway bridge? So this is quite a new question, and it happens about 2,000 times a year, and I'm talking about bridge strikes now. So big problem, how can we avoid it? So the question is, you're driving a high-sided vehicle on an unfamiliar route. Let's get that one out of the way first. It's probably a good idea to plan a route, because you're driving a high-sided vehicle on an unfamiliar route. Plan your route, avoiding not weight, not length, not width, but height restrictions. So plan your route, avoiding height restrictions. The other thing we need to do is ensure the height marker matches the overall height of the vehicle. I don't want you to measure it just yet. What I want you to do is identify the height indicator. Remember on the dimensions. And I want you to confirm or approximate that that height is the same height of the vehicle. But that's an approximation. We want to satisfy ourselves that height is what it says it is. So what we're going to do next, we're going to measure to the highest point. So you're driving a high-sided vehicle on an unfamiliar route. Things you're going to do before you leave the yard, plan your route, avoiding height restrictions. You're going to make sure the height indicator matches the height of the vehicle. And then you're going to measure to the highest point. However, if you had not done any of those things and you'd gone straight out on the road and 20 minutes later you'd hit a railway bridge, there are there is protocol. There are two agencies you need to contact. There is information you need to give them. You need to contact the railway authority. You need to contact the police. And they will ask you where you are. On a railway bridge, you'll have a bridge ID, like a, a, a plaque number, if you like. So you'll have to give them that information. So driving a high-sided vehicle on unfamiliar route, Remember, make sure the height indicator matches the overall height. Measure it to the highest point. Plan your route, avoiding height restrictions. And should you hit a railway bridge, it's the railway authority, the police, and giving the bridge ID. Okay, that's section one, section two done. This is section three, the ability to check for illegal immigrants, illegal immigrants and contraband. You're parked at a border crossing, and you've been for a comfort break and you come back, you suspect you might have illegal immigrants or contraband. Um, so we want to know what checks you're going to carry out before you go through customs. Okay, so we need to go round, inside, under, all over the vehicle. This is where we're going to start. On the passenger side for this particular vehicle. And I'm going to do one of three things. I'm going to open the door. I'm going to get to that fuel cap. I'm going to open it and I'm gonna have a look inside. What they tend to do, smugglers, they'll put a bag of contraband in there. The smell of the diesel will put the dogs off the scent. So the first thing we do is check in that fuel tank, they get that out of the way. Whilst you've got the passenger door open, we can check items in here. So you might, for example, check under behind the seats, in the glove box, sun visor, Checking the door wells as well. Okay, so you come around here, do the fuel cap, do the passenger side. One more thing we're gonna do here is pop the bonnet, because we need to have a look in there in a moment. Okay, we're gonna start going around the vehicle now. And we're gonna have a look in this wheel arch. Make sure there's nothing in there. We come round to the front, open up the engine compartment. Your examiner will tell you, do not touch anything because potentially that could be hot. So we're just gonna get your fingers out now and we're just gonna point in different places where contraband could be found. And we'll have a look in here as well. So if you remember, we started in the fuel tank, we did the passenger side, we popped the bonnet, we did the wheel arch, we've done the engine compartment. Just working our way around now. We have another wheel arch here, let's have a look in there. And we've got to do the driver's side. Same as what we did on the passenger side. Door well, under, behind the seats, sun visor, any possible cubby hole. Okay, moving along. 
must check under the vehicle. Whoopsie. Check under the vehicle. Must have a look on top of that vehicle. And the examiner may say to you, how are you going to look on top of that vehicle? Park up next to some steps. Walk up the steps. Moving along, we can check the wheel arch here. And then we're going to come round to the back. There is not a requirement to get in the back of this vehicle. More accidents associate with people falling from vehicles rather than road accidents. So we're going to open up the low compartment. Don't get in, but we're going to say we're going to have a good look around in here. Check for any illegal immigrants or contraband. Finish where we started, which is that rear wheel arch there. Why? Because we've already done under on top on the other side and we started on the passenger area. All right, that's section one, section two, section three. We're nearly there. Section four, emergency scenarios. You're gonna get one of two scenarios. One is about brake fade, the other one is the vehicle catching fire. Let's do the brake fade first. Okay, some of the vehicles you might be using, for example, this one, doesn't have air brakes. It's just how it is sometimes. You still can explain your answers as if you did have air brakes. So, the question is, you suspect a brake fall in your vehicle. Two questions, I wanna know how you can make sure the compressor's working and what you could do to identify air leaks. So, got two tanks of air. The question is, do we wanna fill those tanks up with air or do we wanna empty them and start with nothing? We wanna empty them and start with nothing, nothing. And how we do that is, you get in the vehicle and you pump the brake pedal. As you're pumping the brake pedal, you will hear air leaving the braking system. And if you look at your gauges, you will also see your air tank starting to drop. So to check for air leaks, the first thing we do is clear the air out of the system. Do that by pumping the brake pedal. Once your gauges are empty, you have no air in the system, we then need to run the engine. We run the engine to run the compressor. In this question, it's asking us how we can make sure the compressor is working. A good idea, whilst you're sitting in a vehicle, is to look at your gauges. If the gauges are going up, surely your compressor is working. Once you've got two full tanks of air, it's advisable that we turn the engine off. You then put your foot on the foot brake and you listen for air leaks. The only time you're gonna be able to hear or well, in order to listen for air leaks, you need to activate the brakes. I'm not talking about brake, pumping the brake pedal, I'm talking about putting your foot down on it, holding it there. At that point, you will then listen for air leaks. It's also advisable to advise them you will check the airlines are all in good condition and serviceable. So that's one of the emergency questions about brake fade. The other one is about the vehicle catching fire. So you're driving down the motorway. It's not a smart motorway, it's a regular motorway. Flames start coming from the engine compartment of your vehicle and you suspect you have a small electrical wiring fire. So for this, we wanna know what the most appropriate fire extinguisher to use and how you're gonna deal with the situation. Right, straightforward. Motorway, incident, vehicle catching fire, get it onto the hard shoulder. I then want you to imagine that you've done everything you need to with that vehicle. So you don't need to tell them that you put the handbrake on, select neutral, put the hazards on, switch the engine on. Just assume that that is done. You pulled over onto the hard shoulder. We need to get out the vehicle. It's not just getting out on the passenger side. It depends on where you are driving. The idea is we're gonna exit out of the safe side, whichever side that may be. So we pulled over to the hard shoulder. We exit on the safe side. There's one more thing we wanna do with that vehicle before, before we might try and tackle that fire. It's an electrical fire. If we tackle it, we don't want electricity running through. So we might wanna activate the battery isolator switch, which is cut the power, which is quite a mouthful, I get it. So just say to them, we're gonna cut the power. So you drive along the motorway, flames are coming out, get it onto the hard shoulder. Get out on the safe side, cut the power. You're then gonna try and tackle this fire. Your examiner will show you a diagram in four different fire extinguishers, water, powder, foam, CO2. They will not ask you which one would you not use, they will ask you which one you would use. So we will use a dry one, on this one we use powder. So once you put that fire out, 
don't complete your journey because you burn out after your electrics, that fire can reignite. You must contact the emergency services. And if, by the time you go to tackle that fire, that fire has developed into something far beyond your control, you get yourself away and contact the emergency services. So whatever, whether you deal with it or you don't, at the end, you must contact the emergency services. Good, so that's section one, two, three, four done. This is the last one, section five, the ability to prevent physical risk. This is what we call your walk round check and your cockpit check. So if you remember section number two, being given a different vehicle to drive for the first time today, you're gonna to do one of these walk round checks and cockpit checks. Now, if you wanna come with me in the test, a bit like in real life, you can use a crib sheet to identify the items that you need to check. Just so happens I have one here. So your training provider may give this to you. Hopefully they will. The point of the matter is, you've only got to check the items that are listed here. And what we're going to do first, we're going to do the walk round, and then it's going to finish with the cockpit check, okay? So if we have a look on here, it's asking us to check the lights, the tyres, the wheels, and the mirrors. All right, let's have a look at lights first. So on this vehicle, in order to activate the lights, you need to have your ignition on. And we're gonna put all the lights on. So this little light cluster here, this is what we call your dip beam. So that's your headlights, your tail lights, and if the vehicle was long enough, you'd have your markers reflectors. Pull this one out for your fog lights. So we've got dip beam on, we've got fog light. We've got full beam, put full beam on. As far as the indicators go, just put the hazards on. It'll save us getting them out of the vehicle. So put the hazards on. So we've got dip beam, we've got fog lights, we've got full beam, we've got hazards. We can now start going around that vehicle and making sure all the lights are working. As there are no lights down here, the first thing I'm gonna to come to is a tire. And if you look on here, we've got tires and we've got wheels. So the first thing we're gonna do is tell them the legal requirement for this goods vehicle tire, which is one millimeter across three quarters of the width, all the way round. And then anything else you add on top of that is an added bonus. For example, you might check for bulges, or any tears, or any cuts, or any cord exposed, or even correctly inflated. But the main thing is one mil, three quarters, all the way round. As far as the wheels go, I'm more interested in the wheel nuts. And you're not going to do this by hand. You're not going to get a torque wrench out. These are visual checks. So sometimes vehicles have these markers. And if you make sure they're indicated the right way, that's a good way of checking. Another way of doing this is if you check these thread lengths here, they should all be the same. If you've got less thread showing on there, chances are those wheel nuts aren't as tight as they should be. But please remember, it's visual checks. Another thing to remember, there's a lot of tires and wheels on this vehicle, and we're gonna go around them all. You do not need to tell your examiner what it is you're checking on every tire. The reason being, you've already told him what you're checking. The rest of it is just checking. So for example, we have an inside tire here. You just identify to the examiner that you're gonna check the inside tire. We're then gonna go round the back of the vehicle because we need to check our lights. And as far as lights, you've got your tail lights, you've got your indicators, you've got your fog light, you also have your number plate light. There is no need to check the reverse light. However, we do need to check the brake lights. Okay, so in this scenario, you will ask the examiner, can you check my brake lights? They will say yes. You then go and put your foot on that foot brake. They'll give you a thumbs up. You then come back round here and you carry on doing your checks. So as we go round the vehicle now, this is how I check the tyres. This is how I check the wheels. And remember, cover your hand on the inside tyre. Moving along, we have a light here. It also says on here we're going to check the mirrors. So some of the mirrors we're going to check here so we can make sure they're secure and no defects. 
All right, make sure it's secure. Doesn't move, no defects. Got a mirror uh, light here. There's your tire. There's your wheel. Coming around the front now. Check all the lights are working. So you've got your dip beam, you've got your full beam, and you have your indicators as well. Remember, you've got to finish where you started. So just along this way. So we have the tire here, and we have the wheel. We have the indicator. Finally, we have the mirror. Make sure it's secure and no defects. All right, so we've gone round the vehicle now. We've done the lights, the tires, the wheels, and the mirrors. That's all done. Now we're gonna do the cockpit checks. So in this instance, it's probably a good idea to turn off the lights. Otherwise you're gonna get a flat battery. And you're then gonna sit in the vehicle. You're sitting in the vehicle because the cockpit checks are done whilst you're sitting in the vehicle. So you're gonna need the ignition on for this. And first item, mirrors. So we've already checked to make sure that they're secure, that there are no defects on there. But whilst we're sitting in here, at that point we can check to make sure they're in the correct position. So remember, mirrors, no defects, in the correct position, and secure. You got the ignition on guys, yeah? Because the next thing you're gonna need to do is activate the wipers and washers. Ignition on, wipers and washers, pull it towards you. There's your wipers and washers. Sorry, did I get you wet then? Next thing we do is check the horn, audible warning device. On this one, it's just on the steering wheel. <laughs> Next thing we've got is the height marker. So if you remember, the height marker is on the dimensions. Height marker is there. Air leaks. Okay, so for section number five, your tell me, show me questions. Your, sorry. Not tell me, show me. Module four. Your air leaks, you have to say this. I put my foot in the foot brake and I will listen for air leaks. That's it. That's it. Instrument panel just here. Turn the ignition off. Bit like we did when you talk to drive. Turn the ignition on. Wait for the lights to go out. You might get a couple of lights that stay on, but that's okay. When those lights have gone out, we then need to check the exhaust. And to do that, we're going to need to start the vehicle. So start the vehicle up. We'll have a look outside. We are checking for a smoky, ex a smoky exhaust. The other thing we're doing is listening for a blowing exhaust. If there was a hole in it, it'd be blowing. And if there was something loose in it, it'd be rattling. And if you look, the final thing you're going to do is your rolling brake check. And that will consist of you driving the vehicle forward five feet and applying the brakes to make sure they work. So, that's section one done. Section two, section three, section four, and this is section five. Remember, you're only gonna get one question from each subject matter. When you pass, your examiner will give you a temporary driver CPC certificate. This is your temporary driver CPC qualification card. The training company, the examiner, would also let the, the DVSA know that you have passed your CPC examination. And as a result, the DVSA will send your driver CPC card through to your home address. Just please bear in mind, your driver CPC card is valid for five years. If you wish to drive after that five years, you have to do 35 hours periodic training before that five years expires. We hope this has given you a nice insight into the Mod 4, what it's all about, and uh, good luck on your testing.